Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding. His church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life. It's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious. Think well. Advance good. This is Q. We are at a moment which seems in many ways culturally dark, but it's not a moment to withdraw. It's a moment to embrace the uncomfortability because the uncomfortability says that there's often something in our flesh that needs to be rooted out. Welcome back to another edition of the Q Podcast. And today you're going to get to hear an 18 minute talk at the most recent Q event by Mark Sayers. Mark's somebody who is his first time being with us at Q in 10 years of doing Q. He's somebody who's had great influence on me, but I've never been able to have him speak at a Q. And I'm so excited for you to hear from him. You know, there are some of these leaders, some of these voices where you, you can just tell they've spent the time understanding, assessing, listening, understanding the times. And I think of the men of Issachar, you know, this famous group of, of people in First Chronicles 12, 32, where it says, the men of Issachar understood the times and knew what to do. And so many times in, in our current culture, you know, we have all this information, we have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have constant feeds of articles and news running 24 hours a day. And we have all of this information, but we don't always have understanding. And I think for the Christian, the key is to have understanding. What is happening right now? What's going on underneath the surface? Sure, we see the chaos. Sure, we see the upheaval. We see things changing dramatically. But can we get a vision for what's happening underneath that? And how might God be seeing that? And how could God be seeing the opportunity for the church in that? That's what I get excited about. I mean, our vision at Q and the work that I've done and the books I've written, I hope that when you read these books and you come and experience Q and you experience these talks, you're getting a sense that God is on the move, that we're not afraid of the cultural moment we're in. In fact, we're embracing it. We're excited about it because we know God's called us in this moment to show up. And that when we show up, we can trust him to be faithful, that he's doing something. He's working to renew all things, to make all things new. And sometimes the upheaval just reminds us that the way the world operates, it does get pretty dysfunctional. And there is a brokenness about it and things do break down. But guess what? When things break down, there's an opportunity to restore, to rebuild, to renew. And I think you're going to hear in this talk with Mark Sayers, a very hopeful vision about that future, helping us understand not only what's happening, but how do we look forward? How do we live into this next year and be the kind of people that show up with confidence, with boldness, with courage, and with joy? Mark wrote a book recently called Strange Days, Life in the Spirit in a Time of Upheaval. It's his most recent of so many that have been so impactful to so many different leaders. I know his book, Facing Leviathan, uh, was an amazing one, leadership, influence, and creating in a cultural storm. It had such an impact on so many leaders I know who were trying to figure out how do we create culture. He also wrote a book several years ago called The Road Trip That Changed the World. And the subtitle, The Unlikely Theory That Will Change How You View Culture, the Church, and most importantly, yourself. And he's dealing with individualism and how that's become so normal in our culture. So he just has a way of telling the stories helping you get involved, helping you start to see from a fresh and new perspective and better understand our context. So let's listen in to Mark Sayers. David Hasselhoff had reached a career turning point. His TV show, uh, Night Rider, had been cancelled and he was attempting to reinvent himself. He decided to put out an album and give to the world his musical talent. <laughs> the English-speaking world uh, did not necessarily appreciate his musical talent, but in the German-speaking lands, he was almost a god. His album, and particularly uh, single, Are You Looking for Freedom, went number one in various German-speaking communities. And in 1989, that song, which is really about a young man finding himself and leaving his rich father and living the Californian dream, struck a chord with Europe. 
that we're seeing the end of an age-old, almost civilizational conflict between capitalism and communism. Hasselhoff was asked after the fall of the Berlin Wall on November the 9th to sing at the New Year's Eve celebrations and sing atop the now demolished or in the process of being demolished Berlin Wall. He was afraid that he wouldn't be seen, so he came out with an incredible shirt that was a creation of sort of lights that flashed in a star pattern. And he was featured by the German television singing on the wall. There's a moment that as he's singing, are you looking for freedom? There's almost a fever pitch as East Germans and West Germans together again for the first time grab onto this moment of incredible freedom. If you watch the YouTube video, and I encourage you to do that after my talk, there's a part where someone in the crowd shoots a firework rocket. It just misses his head, his highly hairsprayed, beautiful mullet, uh, <laughs> which could have been a horrendous uh, inferno. But at that moment, Hasselhoff captured what would be this period from 9th of November 1989 till I think only a couple of years ago, where it seemed that the world was sliding towards a kind of happy, shallow utopia, post-conflict age, an age of what was promised to be unending economic growth, where the internet seemed to provide a new way to connect the world beyond all the different ideological battles that had existed in the past. We're shaped by that dream. Michael J calls this sort of image of globalization the non-place, a place where you're not connected to any particular part of land, where you're not connected to a set of relationships which bind you, but rather we approach them with a contractual sense of relationship, where you can invent and be who you want to be. This is the airport, the mall, the coffee shop, where you could be anywhere in the world. These spaces shape us. They offer us unending freedom, a drunkenness of options and possibilities. But there's a spiritual danger to these places, When you can do what you want to do, when you want to do it, without any responsibility or anything binding your flesh, you're in great spiritual danger. At the same time that the Berlin Wall was falling, on November the 9th, another man the same age as Hasselhoff was having a very different experience. Standing at the front of the KGB headquarters in Berlin, this man was holding the crowds back, He ran inside to the offices and rang the local Red Army tank battalion, asking them to come in and quell the protests. Down the line, the response came, we're ringing Moscow, but Moscow is silent. Vladimir Putin saw that point as a defining point in his life, a very different dream, not one built on an international order, but the collapse of an international order of communism. As the journalist Ben Judah says, that was the moment where... Russians then entered into the 90s, gangster capitalism, postmodern cynicism, and a return not to the non-place, but in the lostness of a world in change, looking for a place, a piece of soil, a flag. The return to the solidity and meaning of nationalism. And so we see the two new poles of our world, no longer left or right, As the Slovenian philosopher Zizek says, between globalism and naturalism, both offering, sorry, nationalism, both offering variant ways of being human. This is now across the world, shaping politics. We see this in the debate over Brexit. We see this in the current French election. Emmanuel Macron, globalism. Marine Le Pen, nationalism. I haven't been following politics here. Has this happened here at all? I'm not exactly sure. Do you have an election? But what this is doing is providing us as believers with two options, two reductions of what it is to be human. In Galatians 4, Paul talks about the temptation of falling back into what he calls the elemental forces or principles of the world, the building blocks of worship based in place that are concrete, that are obvious, that had now been obliterated by the risen Christ. 
This is a temptation he, he warns the church in Galatia about of falling back into these very concrete ways of worship which would limit the freedom that Christ had brought. And so the temptation before us today is to fall back into a kind of sacrament of soil and flag, of who's in, who's out. In the next chapter, in chapter 5, Paul warns the Galatians who have experienced the freedom of Christ to not go on another temptation, to run too far into freedom, to run beyond Christ into a kind of post-Christian kingdom of God without the king. Those two temptations come before us today, warping what it is to be Christian. We find young people emerging into a world where these two things shape how it is to be human. The non-place offering us unending freedom has become a new discipling formational tool. Something which says you can be what anything you want to be. That the good life is running from all that tells us who we are that to pursue freedom is the ultimate guide to the good life. This is now shaping what it is to be a human being. This is now shaping what it is to be a disciple. We're currently facing crisis that's going to come at us. It's not just a millennial phenomenon. It's something which is creeping into how we all act. The art of discipleship this different path, this way of denying self is slowly being subverted by the formational non-place. And so the arts of Christian vocation, of being pastors, activists, people engaging the gospel in the marketplace, the big threat is coming not so much from outside but from within with who we are and how we are now shaping ourselves and becoming incredibly fragile. McLean's magazine, the Canadian magazine, wrote a piece about Ivy League colleges where increasingly young people are entering into them. Epidemic of anxiety. People overrun with a sense of exhaustion but they're not necessarily doing that much. This sense that the freedoms have made us absolutely fragile. And so the sirens call to fall back into kinds of nationalism or Christendoms or cultural Christianity comes right up before those who find themselves in a dissolving world. In the midst of this, the church finds itself in this fascinating no-man's land between the trenches of these two different forces. How do we embrace the freedom of the gospel but don't run beyond Christ into a post-Christian future powered by ourselves? How do we not fall into the elementary forces of the world? At the moment, as the cultural tide seems to be heading in an inevitable post-Christian direction, these two temptations rear their heads. This is a moment for nerve. This is a moment of recapturing what something that is essential about being human. We've had it too comfortable. We've had it too easy. Being human is ultimately about a struggle. Sebastian Junger in his book Tribe says that one of the things that makes us key is being involved in a great struggle for meaning. The early church finding themselves in a Greco-Roman culture that was moving towards being dissolved and falling embraced a kind of battle. The language which Paul used is a battle between flesh and spirit. The idea that the world is not divided by those who are outside of the line or in the line, that we couldn't power a progressive future by our own steam. Instead, we were to be engaged in a battle where we fought ourselves. 
where we fought the flesh, where we fought all our human pretensions to build the world that we want to build through our own power. So at this moment, this critical juncture where the church is trying to find her identity, we must again teach ourselves and teach the people that we lead that to be human is to find meaning in the battle, that we follow the line of Judah, Jehovah, the great God who is a warrior, not fighting against armies, but fighting against the flesh in the world, that that is where we find a sense of meaning, that when we don't know where the lines are anymore, that we look for the lines between spirit and flesh. America's story is totally tied up to my story as an Australian. When the Revolutionary War happened here, it meant that the many indentured workers, British working class people, who had spilled into the cities, the government of Britain couldn't dump them anywhere. So as this victory of this country meant a very different thing for my country, where were they going to put these people? They decided to put them at the complete opposite end of the world to Britain, in a new piece of land found down the bottom of the world, basically like going to Mars. At the very bottom of that country, at the bottom of Tasmania, is a city called Hobart. Just outside of Hobart is a penal settlement created around Enlightenment principles. Jeremy Bentham, the, the utilitarian philosopher designed prisons which were like machines where people could be observed to try and rehabilitate them. They built one of these at the bottom of the world. Prisoners would go in there, be given a number, not a name. The guards would have Hessian put over their feet. They would go to days without hearing or seeing any human being. This was a literal hell on earth. This is where my story and my ancestor's story begins. Elizabeth Brooks, a Welsh servant girl who became pregnant out of wedlock and killed her baby and threw her in a river, taken then to the bottom of the world, put in this horrendous place. The church did not know where the lines were. They did not have a parish system in places like Australia. How were they to operate in this new terrain? The way that the church had operated since Christendom was forged was now up in the air. In the ascendancy in my country was a utilitarian government who would not even build the first church. The first church had to be raised the money with by the first chaplain. It was burnt down. And Australia was declared a post-Christian country in the 18th century. Yet into that space came adventurous Christians. Christians not content with comfort, Christians who are prepared and realise that in moments of cultural change, when all the lines that we're used to have been rubbed out, that actually that's the point when God does the most incredible things. One Methodist missionary sent to the bottom of the world, outside everything he knew well, unsure where to place himself in this new cultural, spiritual environment, realized that his parish was the 30 steps between the death row cell and the gallows. That he would walk with the condemned men, sharing with them the gospel. The accounts tell of men receiving Christ and then being blessed with the gift of tongues as the trapdoor fell. We are at a moment which seems in many ways culturally dark, but it's not a moment to withdraw. It's a moment to embrace the uncomfortability because the uncomfortability says that there's often something in our flesh that needs to be rooted out. We're in a cultural moment where we need to accept that we've had it too easy for too long, that myth mythical utopia that began in 1989, that the world was this conflict-free place, free of ideology, is now gone, and good riddance. The world's always been mad. And as we stand at this point between two temptations, I encourage you to embrace the uncomfortability.
engage in the fight for the flesh. This is the great battle of our age, and this is what it is to be truly human, joining with Jesus in his plan to redeem the world. Thank you. Well, I hope you were challenged, encouraged, and inspired by hearing Mark's thoughts and his views and and how he's encouraging us today. And if you want to share that talk, invite them to come subscribe to the Q podcast, which is available on all platforms. But also go to qideas.org because this week you can actually watch that talk. You can easily share it with friends. And I think this would be the kind of talk that'd be worth sharing with a few of your close friends. Maybe if you work in an organization or maybe you work in a church to say, hey, let's have a conversation about this. Let's all listen and let's come into the room and, and offer our own thoughts and ideas in response to what we just heard Mark say. I mean, that's why we exist at Q. We want to inspire. We want to kind of push you to think about some things, to have access and exposure to some talks and thinking that maybe you're not often hearing, and you don't often hear in the church. You don't often have a place to hear it, and Q is the place where you're going to hear it. And so enjoy it, spread it. Um, We're so excited that these kinds of things aren't just ideas, but they actually start to challenge us in the way we're leading, the way we're living. And so join us anytime at qideas.org, not only for Mark's talk, but to hear so many other talks that took place this last year at Q2017, but hundreds more that we've been able to curate over the many years. And I'll look forward to our next time where we get to hear another talk and discuss it and continue to stir these conversations about what does it mean to stay curious, think well, and advance good. Mm -hmm.